All right, guys, welcome to today's episode. Uh, right now, I'm sitting down with John Kiley, and we're going to be discussing periodization uh, and discussing some of the misapplications as well as in strength sports. So um, to everyone who's you know tuning in, thanks so much for tuning in. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, make sure you smash that subscribe button and turn on notifications to let you know every time a new episode drops. So first off, John, thank you so much for jumping on the episode. I'm really excited to have this chat. Can you just give a, a little bit of a breakdown of, of who you are, your background, some of the work you've been involved in for some listeners who maybe aren't familiar with your work? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I guess <clears throat> cutting to the chase. And I guess the reason you're talking to me today is because I, I've written a couple of papers on periodization. Uh, and although I don't think of myself as an academic, I work for a university. But I don't really do a lot of very academic stuff with that university. I, I work in a thing called a professional doctorate, which is with experienced sports practitioners out in the field. Um, and and I, I help them work their way through doctorates. But as it regards my backstory, uh, I was, like many of your listeners, I, I was an athlete. I was... Uh, uh, I was a boxer, so individual sport, pretty hard training sport, um, sport where you pay the price if you don't prepare well. Uh, not, not, <laughs> no way was I talented, um, but uh, you know, I did manage to maybe twenty or so internationals for Ireland. Uh, and although we're a small country, we, we we're pretty, we're pretty, we. we <laughs> strike above our weight in, in boxing. So it was, while I didn't do anything uh, notable other than, other than um, represent the country a bunch of times, it was really good experience for me as, you know, in my later life as a coach, first of all, and now as somebody who works with coaches to help them get through significant CPD like a doctor. Um, so from a practical perspective, yeah, I was a boxer. I was, I've been a coach since I was 22, which is quite a while ago. Um, again, mostly in combat sports, but also in track and field. Uh, Work-wise, um, I, I spent, yeah, I, I worked in Ireland as a strength and conditioning coach with a number of Olympic sports, Number uh, worked with a number of Paralympic sports, worked with medalists, Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, professional rugby, moved to the UK 2005. I was a head strength and conditioning. I was strength and conditioning lead for UK athletics uh, through the Beijing Olympic cycle. So there I worked with a number of major medalists, fantastic athletes. Uh, so good experience there. Um, around 2012, just after the London Games, I moved to university life. Uh, uh, I work for UK University, but I do it from this room in rural Ireland and kind of pop over and back to, to the UK um, as necessary. Uh, who else? Someone else? Yeah, between 2014 and 2016, I worked with Irish rugby squad. Obviously, r rugby is a big sport over this side. Uh, we won the Six Nations in 2014 and 2015. Went to the World Cup in 2015. S since then, uh, worked with a really good squash girl, Laura Massaro, won, world title, won the World Title of the Year. We worked together in 2013. Uh, since then, I did the Soccer World Cup in Russia with the Egypt squad. That would have been uh, 2018. And in between all of that, I, I work, I write, I coach. That's my life. That's been my life forever. And I, I think that kind of brings me up to here and now. So basically what you're saying is you're pretty green. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, um, <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. I, I honestly had no idea that you uh, that you box. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah. I, well, I actually came from a kickboxing background, the martial arts kickboxing. 
uh, moved into boxing in my 20s, uh, won a couple of Irish titles, got beaten in a couple of Irish finals. Yeah, it, it was, it's hard to know about boxing. It was a great experience. It was a tough experience. And from that perspective, you think you learn a lot from it. So it was a great experience. But, but yeah, but I think from a point of view of where I am now and people I work with, you know, having a, having a hard athletic career, an athletic career where you get injured and you're not as talented as, as others and you have to work harder on things. And it's a good it's a good background to have. It's a good learning experience to kind of set you up for life, trying to help others, you know, through your job. Absolutely. So <clears throat> to dive right into the material, I think one of the big um, issues that I've seen in conversations anyways around periodization is there's not necessarily a, a pre-existing context established around what periodization is. It's almost like two people sometimes will be discussing something and this person's interpretation is one way and this person's interpretation is another way. And in reality, they agree, but it takes an hour to, for them to be like, oh, we're talking about the same thing. So I kind of wanted to start out just by creating an operational definition of periodization, um, just to kind of make sure that people who are listening know exactly what it is that we're talking about and kind of can create those distinctions for themselves as well. Um, so let, let's just start there and then we'll kind of dive into it. Well, can I just say that's a great first question. Um, and I'm rarely asked that, but it is the important question. And you, there was a, let me answer it by, like this. There was a paper published in Sports Medicine, which is you know one of the top two journals in the sports science field, sports science and medicine field. Uh, just in the past couple of months ago, it was a guy called Samuel Bruckner, or, uh, and it was his group. But they came up with, from a literature search, 85 different definitions of periodization. So if you have 85 different definitions, you're going to have a lot of disagreement. Then you're going to have a lot of, peop of people talking past one another. A lot of people criticizing, a lot of people agreeing, but not necessarily talking about the same model at any one time. So that's the first problem. The whole concept of periodization is so vague that it is impossible to disprove, impossible to argue about coherently because it's a, it's a shape-shifting phenomenon. And as soon as one thing becomes apparent, it's, you can wiggle or wriggle out of arguments by just tweaking the definition side slightly. Um, but I'll tell you where the term, where the, the term periodization came from and what the characteristics of it were. And I think there are three characteristics that pretty much define all the definitions that I've come across. So that's one thing. So I'll, I'll do that in a minute. The other thing to say is that aside from, you know, the literature, the, the academic kind of little tiffs and gang turf wars that they have, from a coach's perspective, a lot of the time we use the word periodization without you know, meaning to, to, we use the term to mean the same as planning. So it's like any form of plan can be periodization. And again, that's a, it's a confusing factor. Technically, periodization is a type of planning that's characterized by a couple of features. And those features are, it is, it's a predicted plan. So I predict what will work for you. And I predict what will work for you in a couple of months' time, in a week's time, in a year's time. And it is, if you like, the the um, the articulation of a, of a coach's prediction. Here's what I think we need to do first. Here's what I think we need to do second. Here's what I, I think we need to do for third. So it is, and the whole concept of periodization is really based around prediction. Now, prediction around time frames. So we're going to work in a phase of, you know, and the most common one historically has been four weeks. We're going to work for four weeks. We're going to take a down week. We're going to push again for four, but we're going to do something different. So it's prediction of, of time frame. There's a prediction of sequencing. So 
first we're going to do hypertrophy, then we're going to do strength, then we're going to do power, first we'll do endurance, then we'll do speed. There's, there's an assumption there that things work better in a set sequence. So there's a prediction. If we do this first, then when we do this, this will be better because we did this first. So again, it's, you could call it a prediction. So there's time frame, there's, there's sequence, and again, the underpinning theme is predictability. So, and in a way that makes perfect sense, or at least if you were looking at, at, at periodization through the lens of the people that derive the word and derive the method, that makes perfect sense because at the time, 50s, 60s, that's the way the universe worked, right? That's the way the word worked. It was very mechanical. Uh, if I push here, there's a reaction over here. If I, you know, make this economic change, then this will happen over here. But it's kind of a mechanical assumption. Input, output, directly proportional. If I push here, something happens there and it's re totally related and it's predictable. And if we look at the origin of periodization, so 1952, the Soviet Union as was, came second to the US, <coughs> excuse me, in the medal table, which was perceived as a failure. So they get this guy called Leonid, Mat Leonid Matviev, who a lot of you will have heard about. Um, and they got him to do his PhD on this, how do we plan better in the Soviet Union? And they gave him tens of thousands of data points, athletes in three sports, uh, swimming, weightlifting, and I can't remember if it was cycling or running, but, you know, very easily uh, described sports in terms of volumes, distances, speeds, blah, blah, blah. And basically, they got him to crunch the numbers, which he did. He comes out the back of that, gets his PhD, writes a book, Fundamentals of Sports Training, Little Green Book, um, I should have thought I have it in the shelf there behind me, but I won't get it out now. Small little green book, written in 77, translated into English in 1980. And that, that really is the first mention of the word periodize in the Western literature. Now, he doesn't describe what it is. He just says, you know, you have to periodize, meaning you break something up into sequences of time. And in that book, he described, I guess, a mix of uh, all that data he crunched, conceptualized through the lens, through that very mechanical lens of the pervasive worldview at the time. If I want to understand a complex phenomenon, it's a linear mechanical relationship. Now we know that, well, actually, that's not how complex phenomena work, right? You can't just push here and get an expected output up here. There's all these kind of interwoven, intermingling uh, sub-phenomena that have unpredictable effects on all the other sub phenomena that make up this system. So... I guess the three legs of the stool that periodization was built on, if you boil away all the academic waffle, if you boil away all the, the arguments you're left with, I can predict time frames, I can predict sequences, and I can predict subsequently what this athlete needs to do to achieve over here. And all those 85 or whatever it was, definitions that I, that I talked about a few minutes ago, they're pretty much all still embedded in ca and encapsulated in that belief in predictability. So I guess I'm after saying a lot there, but I guess just to draw a line under it, periodization made complete sense if you were looking at it through the scientific lens of the 1950s and 1960s. 
That's the way everyone thought. If I do this, this will happen. We're a bit wiser now, we're a bit better now, or sorry, not better. We're, we're not better than people were then or cleverer than people were then, but we know more. We've kind of built on what they knew. And that's not the way life works. Um, you can't take any squad, 20, 30, 40 athletes, give them all the same training. You can't know in advance how they'll respond. And then when they do all respond, they'll all respond very differently. Some will get really good off the back of any particular training intervention. Some won't. Some will get injured. Some will be very, very sluggish, slow responders to that. And that's pretty much impossible to tell by just looking at someone and doing a couple of tests and making a judgment. It's kind of something you have to live to see. So I guess winding back around to, to your original question, <clears throat> when I think of periodization, that's what I think of. It is a predictive model. Unfortunately, our biology doesn't work like that. Now, people have kind of interpreted that criticism to mean that, you know, I think periodization is, is rubbish, it's crap, you know, I, I, you know, you don't have had to do with it. But I certainly never have said that. And you need to plan as a coach, you need to plan, you need to know, and the athlete needs to know when they're turning up, what type of session they need to be prepared for, what they're going to do. They need to have some map of the road ahead. They need to have something to, I know where I'm going. I know how I'm going to get there. They need to have confidence in that. They need to have you know, transparency with the coach in, in terms of that road. So planning is critical. Without question. My criticism of periodization in its kind of uh, formal state, if you want to call it that, that my, I, you know, the belief that you can predict what will work for somebody in the future, that clearly, and it's not me saying this, this is overwhelming evidence, that's, that, that just doesn't happen. That's, a, that's an illusion. That's a, a hangover to an old world view that, that just doesn't ring through. How about that? I've, I've said quite a lot there. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that, that was going to be kind of a follow-up question as well. And I think a lot of the criticisms that I've heard of, uh, some of, of the papers that you've written have been literally exactly that, right? It's like, oh, he's saying that, you know, we don't need to plan and for me, that wasn't my interpretation at all. It was more a matter of, well, how far can we extend this predictive power out? You know, and I mean, like, in, in my opinion, like as a coach, I've got people who I plan every week, right? Like every week I have to look at their program and, and write a new, a new week of training, right? And it's just because as much as you want to, you can't necessarily predict that individual's state of preparedness on a week by week basis. Now there's other people who I could honestly write like an eight week training program for, and there, it would be no problem. they just always seem to go through it. No, no issues. And then there's everyone in between who sometimes they need to adjust things every couple of days. And, and so I think that was kind of the, what I got where it was like, the individual response is so varied that you can't necessarily rely on that from like a ubiquitous application standpoint. And, and how far can you extend your predictive power out? That, that was the biggest thing that I got. And I was like, Oh, okay. That makes a whole lot of sense because I mean, as an athlete, as a coach, it, it's, it's pretty apparent when you're, when you're coaching people that you can't really do that. Not, not super effectively anyways. And then even what works for someone right now, like I said, that, that, I'm thinking of a particular athlete where I can write four weeks of training and they go through it and they get awesome results. But that specific athlete, as they've progressed, everything that we've done has had to change, you know? So, so as that athlete gets better and, and becomes a little bit more high level, what works for them no longer works. And then what works for them works for a shorter period of time than it did before. 
And then we need to undulate things a little bit differently. And we need to, you know, so we had to switch from like, let's say a block model to a concurrent model to an alternating model to, and, and so it's just kind of constantly changing. And so that was kind of what, what I got from uh, what you were saying, which for me anyways, makes perfect sense. So I understand some of the criticisms, but in my opinion, they just kind of seemed like they were sort of a straw man in, in, in that sense. Um, which kind of leads me to, I guess, my next question. I, you, you mentioned a couple of things, or you alluded to a couple of things there about how it's not necessarily a closed mechanical system of input-output. And so I pulled a, a sentence from one of your recent papers. Um, essentially, it says, the progressive neurobiological wear and tear ultimately manifests as some blend of psycho-emotional, physiological, neurological, immunological, and or behavioral impairment. And I feel like that kind of hits the nail on the head um, and, and I just kind of wanted you to expand on that and in relationship to our predictive power and what actually goes into that equation um, to determine our level of preparedness on any given day. Right. Listen, I'm scribbling a note there because uh, just before I answered that, I, I just want to maybe add a little bit to, to, to what we just talked about. From a... I think there's a lot of confusion be, between kind of the academic world and the coaching world in terms of what periodization means. I think that I, I obviously feel that the criticism that I've leveled against uh, the conventional periodization concept in, in the past 10 minutes, that's pretty much accurate. You go to the contemporary literature, just you know the science and, and that's what it is. But I think that doesn't mean that to plan in blocks or phases or to have a preferred sequence, that doesn't mean that's wrong. It just means it's not, you can't point to and say, well, that evidence proves it. It's way too complex. But I think what you need to do is adapt your planning method for your planning context. So if I'm working with one elite athlete, we can have that kind of ongoing communications. We can we can change if if the athlete is sufficiently experienced, you've good dialogue, you know what information is important to kind of access, what's important to talk about, you can adapt on the fly very effectively. But if you're I don't know, a university strength coach working with 300 athletes in different squads, you can't do that. You don't get 30 seconds of airtime with them. You need to, you need to economize. You need to think, well, I've one hour to plan for 40 people. I can't individualize everything. So what do I do? And maybe then you might decide, well, I'm going to use that method of periodization because it makes sense for me. But there's a difference between liking something because it's pragmatic and it's a, a good, effective shortcut and liking something because you think it's proven and like that's where I get a little bit squitchy is when people start talking about oh well that's you know the science of periodization and stuff like that uh, I don't think there's a science of periodization I think there might be a practicality of periodization in some contexts and then people went in retrospectively found little bits of science to support their argument so it was kind of like I like this now I'm going to find evidence rather than the other way around so, 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 so that was just one thought on that. So periodization, again, in the kind of the predictive model of periodization, the, I don't see any evidence to support that whatsoever. But that doesn't mean that you as a coach shouldn't in some contexts use some off the shelf model of periodization. And I think that kind of raises one other thing that I do think is important and that is one of my, one of the things I do disagree with, or no, not disagree with, but one of the dangers I think of accepting periodization as a scientifically proven model is it switches off your critical thinking. Why am I doing a four week phase? I'm doing a four week phase because that's what it says. That's what Bondarchuk, Matviev, Verkashansky, whoever it was, pick your old dead Soviet. Um, sorry, Bondarchuk isn't it? Um, and pick their model and then justify off the back of that. For me, what's more appropriate is 
you figure out what's the best length to face for you. There is no magical length. Nobody can tell you what's the best length to face for your athletes. you got to figure it out. Uh, you know, and that's, I guess, one of the idiosyncrasies of periodization was like, well, we're going to do a four-week or a six-week hypertrophy phase. And no one seems to ever ask, well, how do you know if you have achieved your goal at the end of six weeks? If you like, there's an assumption that we'll do four weeks of this and then we will have achieved our goal. How, how does that work? I mean, are you monitoring that goal? Are you measuring it? Wouldn't that be a better way to do it? Think if I need this amount of strength gain, should I not stay at that? Should, should that phase last after I get that strength gain? Or should I extend that phase if I don't get that strength gain? I'm not sure if I'm making that point clearly, but hopefully you see the point. It's We make these arbitrary judgments and say, well, we're going to do six weeks of this without ever quantifying this will mean it was successful or this will mean it isn't. And what do I do if it wasn't? That never happens. Yeah, no, that definitely makes a lot of sense. It's, it's almost like there's a disassociation or sorry, disconnect between like athlete response and, and the planning of the training. Whereas, and that's why I'm such a big fan of um, some of the concept that Mike T has put out. I know you've been on his podcast a handful of times and uh, you know, he talks about following athlete response and then kind of looking retroactively and being like, okay, what are the common denominators of, you know, their, their performance, either going up, going down, whatever, and then kind of creating some sort of like a base model from that to determine a lot of those variables, or at least get in the ballpark, right? If, if we're looking at things as like more of a spectrum. And I feel like that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, like, cause on the one hand, I think a lot of people talk about individualization, <clears throat> but then when you say like, Hey, what do you mean by that? And how do you individualize programs? They're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like we're doing six to eight reps here. We're doing five to three reps there. We're doing eight to 12 reps here. And, and it's like just kind of standard stuff. But then it's like, okay, well, why are you using this versus a concurrent model? Why are you using this versus an alternating model? Why are the, like, exactly like you said, why is a mesocycle four weeks versus two weeks versus six weeks versus, you know, anything else. And I, I think like when you start kind of looking at it from a different frame of reference and the thing that really helped me actually was looking at it from a, a sport perspective, like you were saying, you know, how are you going to apply this to 30 or 40 elite level football players? And it's like, Hey, that's a, that's a great question. Cause I think sometimes you can kind of get bogged down and, and look at the definition of something or look at, look at a concept through the lens of your own sport uh, so for me, that that's powerlifting. And it, for me, it's very easy to be like, oh, periodization makes perfect sense. It's powerlifting. There's not a whole lot of inputs to, to really impact your performance. It seems pretty straightforward to me. But then you start kind of looking at it from like different lenses. And then it's like, oh, okay, I understand how things can kind of break down. You know, it's or at least it's a little easier to understand how things can break down when you look at it from the standpoint of like, I don't know, a three sport athlete or a football player where there's a whole lot of unpredictability there, even especially in season. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting um, <clears throat> as well. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we actually did cover this, but can you just kind of touch on the other inputs that, that are coming in uh, outside of just like training stressors? And I guess this is a good time to time to talk about like stress as well, like more of an umbrella standpoint. Yeah, um, okay, so I think, uh, and I don't want to be beaten up in periodization. As I said, you know, the people that, who were most associated with periodization, historically, Matthew, Verkashansky, et cetera, they were smart people embedded in sporting culture, the same as we are, and they thought about it logically, but they just didn't have the advantages we have in terms of, they didn't have all this other conceptual refinement and clarity that we have now. You know, and no doubt in 30 years time, people will look back on us as if we were, you know, didn't know what we were doing. But again, we have, it's our job, I guess, to, make the use of the insights and knowledge we have as best we can. But periodization, 
as it was represented by Matthew Verkashansky, etc., and as it's been rep represented in the academic literature, as purely a physical, mechanical phenomenon. I've never seen in a periodization paper a coach talk about, well, it's actually important what the athlete thinks about the program. And if the athlete doesn't understand why they're doing what they're doing, it doesn't matter how nice their technique is really, because that's fundamental. Or if an athlete is anxious, worried, if they don't believe in what they're doing, that has a real negative impact, regardless of how how pretty the Excel sheet or, or even how nice their, their technical model, those things are fundamentally important to how well I adapt. So I guess the thought experiment I do is you genetically engineer me or you split us in half. So we're both identical. We've lived the exact same life up to now. Uh, and you split or you cleave us now and we both go into the gym to do a session. And just before I go in, you say something to me that stresses me out. So what does stresses me out mean? Okay. Well, stress me out, me, stressing you out would mean you take in some information from the environment or you think of something that hadn't been in your mind. And essentially you are now in a state of uh, you, you are in a state, you, you feel you are under threat. And you can kind of break stress down, boil it down to sense of insecurity and threat or a sense of security and competence and stability. So let's say they are extreme. If I'm the identical twin and I'm here and the other one shifts down this end of the spectrum, what does that do? Okay, well, every, it changes concentrations of various neurotransmitters in your brain. What do they do? They signal downstream hormonal release, immunological factors, all kinds of chemicals that in the right context, in the right concentrations, save your life. You're in a fire, you're attacked by a lion, whatever it is. Those are the, that's the release characteristics that will prime you to escape. You get those in the wrong context, worrying about your tax returns as an example, or stressing about training because you really hate training on Tuesdays because you always have to do that exercise that winds up your knee or whatever it is. That is a direct response. That is a direct influence on your level of functioning, your chemical backdrop, your electrical backdrop. And that influences how well or not you respond to that training. Now, we never think of that, right? <laughs> We, we think about, we, we say we think about adaptation, but that's a fundamental part of adaptation. You, the biological backdrop upon which you overlay training dictates how you respond, but we never think of that half of the equation. We only think of the, how do I load this person? What's their technique like, et cetera, et cetera. What can I impose externally rather than thinking about well, what's the internal environment like? And is that ready? Is that primed for an optimal adaptation to this stimulus? And again, that's never mentioned in the periodization literature. And for me, again, it's like, and I understand why people think I'm totally against periodization because I say so many things that sound critical of it. But what I'm criticizing is, it's not even criticism. It's pointing at something and saying, we need to do better here. If our job is to make people better as coaches, we need to understand this stuff and then we need to leverage it. We need to, we need to take actions and we need to plan. And planning how we're going to do that is as important as planning the, how you modulate the sets and reps, at, at least from my perspective. Yeah, no, 100%. And I mean, I think that that's something in particular that coaches – can appreciate because you know any coach who's who's been coaching for any reasonable amount of time has had an athlete that they've worked with where training has become stale they've just kind of not enjoyed it that much 
And then all of a sudden you really dig deep into it and you're like, oh, okay, here, let's, let's change training up. Let's do this. And they get excited again. And all of a sudden this athlete is like hitting PRs. They're just crushing it. Their, their level of perceived effort kind of goes down because they're enjoying the, the training so much more. And they've got a lot of like individual buy-in. And this actually happened to me like the other day where, you know, one of my, one of my athletes was, uh, she was still making like very good progress, but she just kind of wasn't really enjoying the training. So it's like, okay, even though we're making progress, I still think it's important for her to be bought in. So let's change it up. Let's give her a little bit more bodybuilding, get her doing a little bit more like glute training stuff, because even though she's a power lifter, like, <laughs> you know, she's a girl and she wants a big butt. And so we started doing more stuff like that. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, I love this. Like when we talk, you know, on, on the weekly basis, when we do our check-ins, she's, she's absolutely loving it. She's like still crushing PRs, but it's like her, she's like reinvigorated and rebought into the, to the program. And I think that that's something that a lot of coaches have experienced and can definitely understand uh, the impact that that has on just training performance, especially when you extend that out over a couple of months, right? If you're just kind of, grinding through things and it becomes monotonous and it's definitely not something you really want to continue doing. Um, so, so that makes a lot of sense. Can, can you, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to jump in. Sorry. Um, it, it's not just a kind of enthusiasm and psychological buy-in though. It's those things change chemistry. Chemistry changes how you move and how you function how you move and how you function change injury profiles. You are more likely to be injured if you are stressed, clearly. You will respond uh, less uh, quickly to rehabilitation if you are stressed. And again, these are studies that have been done. So if you don't have that sense of confidence, buy-in, expectation, it's not just a nice to do, that's a need to do. That's as important as the exercise design. Uh, that's as important as, you know, I, I, I do a lot of work in kind of rehab, return to play type situations with, with you know, really good athletes. And I used to be a real uh, kind of Nazi around design and really fussy about it. And, and I still am. And I, and I think there's still a place for that. But I do realize now that, that's not the only important thing. The athlete has to has to buy into it. If not, it's it, it will not work in, in my book at least. Or it's the odds are stacked against it. I would much rather a flawed program that the athlete believed in for whatever reason than what I considered a perfect program that they didn't believe in. So I guess kind of move, moving on, I, I wanted to. Talk about the difference between like, or I guess first, just talk about allostasis and like what it is, what is allostatic load? And can you kind of differentiate that between like the gas principle? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, so again, so, so gas is this general adaptation syndrome. Um, and it was, I guess, formulated by a stress physiologist, I guess, the godfather of all stress physiologists, Hans Selye, who is mentioned in all the, the kind of classical periodization works, except, interestingly, all the Soviet ones. But he's only not mentioned in the Soviet ones because they didn't want to give any publicity to non-Soviet research at the time. So they didn't talk about gas in the Soviet literature. They talked about supercompensation instead. Um, so, so gas is basically, I guess what you might call a common sense, common sense until you look at it closely principle. And it's just if, uh, if you're subjected to a stress, there's, kind of, there's a, an alarm response. And then in the kind of wave-like form, that changes and you adapt. The, the stress response tapers off, declines, and then you adapt and you compensate. And when you compensate, you get a little bit better. It's just that 
you know, the way we were all told when we were kids about how muscle grows. Well, you stress it and it breaks down and then it builds back with a, a little bit extra on top, just in case it happens again. In, in a nutshell, that's what super compensation was. Again, Hans Elliot was working, I, I guess he published that idea in, I think it was 34, 35, 36, something like that. Groundbreaking work, but 1930s, actually it was 56 maybe, sorry, 1950s. Uh, but it was the body of work for over the, that, that he constructed over 20 years. And that still gets recycled in our training literature all the time as justification for, for how we load. The other term that you have to mention if you mention periodization and gas is homeostasis. Now, and we all, I think, have a sense of what homeostasis is. It's all the systems in our body have this kind of zone of optimal functioning, let's call it. We all have this it's kind of bandwidth that we operate within. And if we get thrown outside of that bandwidth, then there's a response, there's a, a reaction. And our reaction brings us back down into that optimal bandwidth. And we're, we're back to normal, we're back to homeostatic, uh, homeostatic state. And in a way that's, that's the basis of all training theory, right? If I impose a stimulus, it may cause it'll cause some micro damage, but that micro damage rebuilds, and now I'm in a better state than I was. And then homeostasis, I return to homeostasis in a sense. But again, since Celia's time, that the whole field has moved forward. And Stress physiologists now don't don't think of gas as kind of a thing, <laughs> as such. Um, okay, so you mentioned the concept of allostasis. Think, here's a good way to think about it. There is such a thing as homeostatic states in your body, but they're normally things that are absolutely critical to your life, like pH in your brain. Uh, osmolarity in your brain, blood flow in your brain, things that it's kept within a narrow bandwidth. And if something goes wrong, if all of a sudden there's some kind of perturbation, some shock, and it's knocked out, you're in danger of dying really quickly. So there's all type of alarm reactions that happen and boom, takes it back into place. But there's only a few of those systems and none of them are anything we think about or anything that they're all kind of very much life-threatening situations. Homeostasis doesn't apply to muscle growth, you know, improving your endurance, anything like that. They're not homeostatic systems. They're not very tightly controlled. There isn't an alarm and an instantaneous reflexive reaction if they're knocked out of sync or if, if they're really challenged. All the other systems in your body are thought of as allostatic systems. Now, I, I don't want to get bogged down in terminology. So with my coach hat on, this is how I'd explain it. Um, and it's harder to explain it without, like when scientists are explaining things, they use big words that confuse everyone. It's harder to explain it just using normal words, which is what I'm going to try and do now. So you'll have to excuse me if I put my foot in it a couple of times. Allostasis doesn't work like, uh, allostatic systems don't work like homeostatic systems. Homeostatic systems just sit there and wait. And if they detect a shock, then they spring into action. They're reflexive. An allostatic system predicts your whole brain, your whole, yeah, your brain, I was gonna say your whole brain, your whole body, but essentially your brain is a predictive machine. And it's designed by evolution to be very, very good at predicting. So an allostatic system will predict this shock is going to happen. And the shock might be, I'm going into a competition, 400 meter race. I'm predicting that I'm gonna to have to start running really quick, really soon 
for whatever, 44 seconds. And your body starts to change. As soon as that prediction is made, your body starts to change. Concentrate on your uh, neurochemical concentrations in your brain change. That drives downstream change. Everything changes. Concentration, sweat rates, heartbeat, blah, 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 blah. A whole kind of symphony of change is driven by this prediction. Okay. Now, and at a certain level, that makes sense, but we, I think, don't realize how far that goes. So what I'm saying is, and obviously not, you know, I'm based on my opinion on what the science is. Our brain works as a predictive machine. How we react to any stimulus is kind of planned in advance to a certain extent. If you're getting under whatever, you're, you're going under a heavy bar, you're, you're planning on doing a few reps. You're thinking about that before you go under it. You have you anticipate what the load is going to feel like on your shoulders, what it's going to feel like in the bottom position. Your brain sends out signals, activates the muscles, activates the hormonal system. Everything starts to change before you do the action. As you do the action, you get signals back, proprioceptive feedback. Here's where I am. Here's how it feels. Now, what your brain does, and your brain is all about energy efficiency. Small space, not a lot of energy, needs to be very conservative. So what your brain does is, if the predicted signal matches the feedback signal, they cancel each other out. That's fine. It only detects and transmits error further up to the higher brain regions. So you make a prediction. Uh, biology, mechanics, everything is activated by that prediction. If there's an error, that error comes back up, hits your, hits your higher brain cent centers, and then you do a remedial action. So I guess I'm after kind of going off on a tangent there, but my main point was the difference between homeostatic and allostatic systems. Homeostatic or reactive. Something happens, they react. Allostatic is everything else other than those critical uh, subsystems. Allostasis is everything we need to think about in training is a predictive system. It predicts what's going to happen next, and it starts to adapt in advance of that happening. Now, what's the relevance of that to training? Uh, I think there's actually more than meets the eye. Predictions are something that you can change. I, I guess the clearest example I can think of at the moment is pain. So in pain, pain is really, a, a, it's heavily tied up. We always think of pain as directly proportional to the level of damage to tissues. But it's clearly not. And you have people with a lot of damage to tissues, but no pain. You have people with on scans or MRIs, no damage to tissue, but a lot of pain. What's the difference? Well, on that in that link between brain and tissue, there's some there's a prediction of pain that's become locked in. Or there's a prediction of pain that's become broken and now they're pain isn't experienced in the brain. So what's the relevance of prediction to training? Well, I think it has a big effect. And I'll tell you why I think that. If you, even if you were to look at the human experience over, over long time scales, there's some been, been some recent research that looked at that ask people to predict how long they would live, how you know, how long before you die, basically. And I think it was a 20-year follow-up. The people who predicted they would die earlier died earlier, regardless of if these people were equalized for kind of health. So it wasn't that they'd underlying health issues. And you think, well, okay, 
The other study that made me sit up and take notice is, uh, this was a very large population, maybe 64,000 Americans. How active are you? And people estimated how active they were. So they were, you know, on a spectrum. I'm not active, I'm very active. And the people who said they were not active died sooner, which sounds, okay, I can see how that would happen. But the curveball is that they also actually documented how active they were. And when you looked at how active they were, there were people who said they were, they were active, but they weren't really active. And there was people who said, well, I'm not really active, but they actually were very active. And the important discriminator, the, the indicator of when they were likely to die wasn't how active they were. It was how active they thought they were. Now, you start kind of thinking about stuff like that and trying to blend that in with our conventional training model and I guess what you're coming out with is, oh, okay, there's a lot more to, to training than just stimulus reaction, stimulus reaction. It's like there's a, what are my beliefs around this stimulus? What do I believe, what, what do I believe will happen to me subsequent to this stimulus? And there's a really big modulating factor there around what do I think will happen? What do I expect to happen? Now, let me just maybe really briefly give you an example of this that you'll all be familiar with, and that's placebo effect. So, again, from a conventional biomedical perspective, you know, a conventional stimulus response perspective, placebo makes no sense. It's, it's, it's a paradox. Why would my brain and body wait for me to heal, like wait for a um, wait for a wait for permission to heal. Why would I wait for permission to heal? And, and kind of in a sense, that's what a placebo is, right? You go in, and if someone in a white coat gives you a tablet and says you're you're going to feel better, and it's only a sugar pill, but you do feel better. Why would my body and brain wait for permission to heal? And the answer is, well, your brain is making a prediction. What's my current state of affairs? Am I under threat? If yes, I'm going to put on the alarm signal. I'm going to feel pain. I'm going to feel uncomfortable. I'm going to feel anxious. Okay, this person with a qualification on the wall and a white coat and a stethoscope or whatever the situation is, they're telling me everything is going to be okay. And straight away, things change and I feel better. A placebo effect in, in sporting context, I think is it's it's very big. I mean, the science, there isn't a lot of it there, but most of it is suggesting that certainly <clears throat> you probably have come across a lot of the nutritional stuff. You give someone a placebo, tell them it's the next big thing. One of the most famous studies was weightlifters in 1972, gave them a sugar pill, told them it was steroids, everyone got stronger. No, really simple design, lots of flaws for sure. But even still, um, placebo's really strong effect in medicine and, and in psychiatry. And I think in sport, it's just we haven't really investigated it a lot. But what I'm suggesting, the underpinning, like placebo is a sub-phenomenon. The underpinning phenomena is our biology operates by predicting what's likely to happen next and then adjusting to that prediction. That prediction is positive. You know, our, our neurochemistry moves in a positive direction. If that prediction is negative, well, that's what we call stress. That's when our neurochemistry changes, puts us into a defensive mode where defensive is conserve energy. Conserve energy means store fat. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to commit energy to building projects. Putting on muscle is a building project. Healing is a building project. So I've gone a very long, torturous route around saying that I think there's multiple lines of really, really clear evidence to suggest that all of these phenomena that are 
really in the past 10, 15, 20 years becoming to be realized in, in medical psychiatric contexts. I think they're, they're going to revolutionize our world, I think, as coaches, because it will... And maybe it's only confirming stuff that a lot of great coaches knew 15, 60 years ago. And that's around, as you mentioned earlier, it's about buying. It's about relationships. It's about communications. It's about open dialogue. It's about honest dialogue. It's about having a plan that you believe in having a plan that you feel you have part ownership in that it's been evolved for you that you can you know when you go to train you you're you're happy you're confident you feel it's the best for you you control yourself into it and because of the effects on, on your brain and body you will they will that will create the conditions that lead to optimal adaptation uh, and I guess coming back belatedly to where I started, it's not a mechanical problem. It's not training stimulus, training out output. There's a whole filter there in the middle that is us and our brain and our past experience and our relationship with our coach and our confidence in the plan and our ability to input into the plan and control our own future. All of those things make a huge difference bringing it back to periodization, we kind of sidestep it in our conventional training theory. So I've, uh, I've said a bunch there. I think your listenership is now down to probably just me and you. <laughs> no, it, it was honestly really interesting. And I mean, I think, you know, when, when you look at, especially the biopsychosocial model of, of pain, right? I know you brought that up uh, in terms of like imaging, saying the individual's fine and then they experience pain and the reverse is also true. That's something I've written about as well in a handful of like review papers. But uh, I, I think it's funny that some of that applicability hasn't necessarily had the same type of influence on uh, the coaching sphere. I mean, it's definitely bleeding in for sure. Uh, I've noticed, but it, th there does seem to be a little bit of like a delay or a lag uh, for that kind of entering the, this world. And I think one of the really interesting things that you brought up as well is, you know, the number of inputs and our perception of, of a specific context, right? So our emotional response to a specific context can have a pretty profound influence on what that particular stress means. So let's say we don't get a very good night's sleep. And then we have a training session the next day. If you believe that that lack of sleep is going to really impact your performance, by extension, it might. And if you believe that, ah, it's just one day, it's not going to make a big deal, then it might not. And so, so I think that that's kind of another confounder that just kind of adds to the layers. I don't know. I, I just find it's pretty interesting um, well, going down these little rabbit holes. Well, if it's okay, I mean, I think this is a quite a big rabbit hole. Yeah. I think it's... And I think what we're, you know, fumbling around here is a big, big, big gap in our theory, a big, big gap in how we're educated as coaches, for sure. Now, okay, so if we, I think the example you brought up is a really good one. Major competition, athlete nervous, athlete has a bad night's sleep. I've been in like real life situations, uh, kind of world stage events where the athlete says that oh, I didn't sleep or I really feel dehydrated or something's wrong. You know, I just did a pee test and um, I'm dehydrated and the staff panic and everyone starts running around. And for me, it's, a, you know, the right approach is not to react to something like that when it's too late to react to something like that. It's our job as coaches to give the athlete the resilience and the confidence to say, well, hey, bad night's sleep, big deal. This is the biggest stage of my life. I'm going to be ready for it. Come hell or high water, doesn't matter if I don't sleep for a week, I will be ready for it. I will adapt my, my warm-up. I will change my self-talk. 
but I'll be ready for it. And I have confidence that I will because I am a resilient athlete because my coach has conditioned me to be a resilient athlete. So it kind of comes back around to the coach. If an athlete is panicking on the day of an Olympic final, that's well, that's our fault. We need to be conditioning that person, not wrapping them in cotton wool. And, you know, I, I think that's something that's overdone in professional sports, use of technology, taking measures, making athletes very sensitive to those measures. So if the athlete doesn't hit their normal measures, they start freaking out or everyone starts going into a panic instead of just saying, well, hey, swings and roundabouts. Maybe I'm on a bad day, but I still got to go out and perform. Uh, sorry, that was just a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> Uh, that kind of came up there, but yeah, and yeah, that's part of our role is nurturing resilient athletes. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it's funny how, like, the social inertia of certain concepts. And actually, I know you talked about this in in the the your your most recent review paper. Um, you talked about the social inertia and how a lot of these things just kind of have been perpetuated but haven't necessarily been questioned because so many people are, are talking about it. They're like, Oh, it must be true. You know? And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting when you start going into it and all of the parallels you see with, with your own life anyways. Right. So for, for my experience training, I'll train, I'll do something. And I'm like, huh, it seems like when I do this, this happens. And so you just kind of start making adjustments and then, I don't know, as you kind of superimpose these, like, I guess, emerging concepts, they seem to fit together quite well, you know, now, whether that's like some sort of internal bias that I might have based on my own experience, experience with my athletes, whatever. Um, it just seems to give a little bit more clarity to, to issues that were previously a little bit more murky and offer some potential solutions on, on like, okay, how do we need to direct the, the training of this athlete? How do we need to direct our relationship? You know, what kind of dynamic are we looking to, to create between athlete and, and coach so that we can kind of be on this, like um, more or less the same wavelength, right? So you can utilize their feedback effectively. Like you said, you know, if, if an athlete is like brand new and you're like, how did that feel? Like a 20% squat is going to feel like a hundred percent to them. Whereas if they're a little bit more, you know, experienced, they can say, ah, you know, like here's a more accurate representation of my level of effort and so on. And then you can kind of have that dialogue that makes things a little bit more effective. But I, I wanted you to kind of delineate between periodization and program design, because I sometimes feel that people use those things somewhat synonymously, you know? Yeah, again, it's part of the confusion in this field and so if, if we take periodization as characterized by, you know, the prediction of time frames, the prediction of training sequencing, and the, and the prediction of, well, if you do these things, you'll get this result. If we get that as a basic catch-all for all those 85 different periodization definitions that are around, yeah, the, that's just missing a huge component of what actually drives athletes to become physically better we need to as coaches just be cognizant of the fact that we are the placebo in an, to an extent we are agents of placebo how we communicate with the athletes how we present to the athletes the systems we design around the athletes they're all fundamental not only just as part of being professional but they're fundamental to actually driving training adaptation. How they res respond to that set of squats is going to relate to a whole load of emotions around how they feel about you, their program, how it evolved, its relationship to past experience. All those type of things are always being internalized and are always being blended to make a prediction of what's going to happen next in the short term and in the longer term, and then you adapt to that forecast. So I feel like I've, 
you put you you if you don't mind me skipping back a little bit, you brought up a, a great point a while ago about the biopsychosocial model. So the biopsychosocial model obviously makes sense, but it's so vague that you can't really take any concrete lessons out of it from a training perspective, other than, yeah, well, you know, biology is influenced by psychology in some vague, undescribed way. And it's, you know, in, influenced by the social context, again, in some vaguely and undescribed way. But I guess since the turn of the, the century, really, there's another model, another way of understanding how we work that has gradually gained traction. And certainly within the neuroscientific literature, it's been famously referred to as, uh, as important to neuroscience as, as evolution is to biology. <laughs> that's quite a statement. Uh, and that's predictive processing sometimes called predictive coding. And, and that, I guess, is, is what I've already mentioned. It's the theory that we're not a biomechanic, we're not a biomedical system. It's not stimulus react, it's prediction, stimulus, sorry, prediction, reaction, comparison with feedback, adjustment. That's the way we operate. And again, coming back around, I just use that as it, it takes a little bit of time to get your head around that. But once it does, it makes the influence of things like placebo and stress and all those on training. It makes it perfectly sensible and logical and simple. And if you want to look at it from an evolutionary perspective, it's, it seems nearly obvious. If I want to reduce the amount of space my brain needs, the amount of energy my brain needs, I'm not going to wait for something to hit me and then react to it. I'm going to predict what's going to happen, start to adapt before it happens, correct then based on error, and, and that's how I operate. Implication for training is the, your athlete better believe, they better have faith, and if they don't, you need to give them that or you need to change something that you're doing. So eventually you wind up with a program that both you and the athlete do buy into. Uh, and that could be as important or it is as important or more important than the sets and reps, the time frames, the periodization. So... And again, I guess I'm beating the same drum. We leave it out of our conventional coaching education, our thought. Um, and I think it's something that we need to integrate a bit more. So, so training planning for me, and this is just coming back to a, a question a while back that I skimmed off. Training for me is, um, it's all dependent on context. context. Squad of 40, 15 year olds, one elite 30 year old, really good, um, really educated in training in terms of they know what they're doing, they know how they feel, they feel they know what works, etc. etc. So a coach can have really good dialogue. How you plan for that one is totally different than how you might plan for an athlete who doesn't have that experience or a group of athletes who don't have that experience. And that means that, well, maybe I have to use an off-the-shelf training program, but I'm going to add in value. I'm going to, you know, for five minutes at the start of every session, I'm going to explain to the athletes, here's what we're doing. Here's what you feel. Here's how it's going to help you. Something simple like that. Something that just promotes that, oh, yeah, now I understand why I'm doing what I'm doing and how it should feel. So they can start calibrating to those things. You start drip feeding out little bits of ongoing education like that. And you're in a situation two seasons later, five seasons later, where there can be a really good, meaningful dialogue between you and, and athletes or athlete groups. And again, for me, as we're like, it's nearly taken some responsibility for nurturing the full athlete 
and their understanding. And it's a total rejection of the conventional or historical perspective of the coach as, you know, the coach is the brain, the athlete is just the body. The coach says the athlete does. Now, I guess the other thing I should say is that there was always coaches who had that philosophy. They had that philosophy without the kind of fancy science that I'm leaning on. Uh, I guess famous example that I always think of is there was an Australian coach, Percy Ceruti, coached Herbelia to a gold medal in 1960 in Rome. And he had this whole kind of rounded philosophy about how he coached the athlete. So, and, and some of it was quirky, but it was his personal coaching style and the athletes bought into it and respected him. And it was kind of meet the athlete, look into their eyes, talk to them. How are you feeling? What, you know, here's our goals. How are we going to get closer to those goals today? All the type of things that you might think, well, that's just normal coaching. Yeah, you know what? I don't know how normal it is. We all do some bits of it, but do we all do everything we could to, um, yeah, I guess for me as a coach, it's always how could I do it better? How could I do it more fully? How could I operationalize it more efficiently? And there's always those those questions and, um, and it's always just like, you know, the athlete, you're always looking for that extra inch. And I guess the purpose of that diversion was just to say that I'm not sitting here saying, we're in any way superior to any coaches that came before. We're obviously not. We have access to more underpinning science, more background knowledge. But the great coaches, I think, have been doing this forever. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, that's enough said there. Your perspective as an athlete is, is so imperative. And I think this is something that's probably most easily seen in combat sports. So I used to box and, and fight in Muay Thai as well when I was younger. And um, the team that I'd work with were all also really successful, right? Like they all had like national titles, world titles, things like that. And so everyone was like a very good boxer. But then there is one guy in particular who is phenomenal. He was a phenomenal athlete phenomenal boxer, extremely technical, fantastic coach, and he'd always find a way to lose. He'd go out there and he would just completely outclass everyone and he'd just find a way to lose every single time. And I was like, what are you doing, right? And you see this in, in like elite fighters who they get knocked out, they come back, they're squeamish, they're just not the same person mentally. They have all the tools to beat the, their opponents, but they just can't seem to put it together. And And it's like, you're literally carrying a loaded gun and you're just afraid to pull the trigger. Right. And, and so I think that's a really easy way to, to kind of understand it because I think people can kind of see that fairly easily. Whereas maybe in powerlifting, it's not quite as clear sometimes from the outside looking in. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a major issue. And so like, I, I like how you kind of gave some sort of parameters around how to develop you know, your own emotional resiliency and, and your own, I mean, I guess even psychological resiliency as well. So one of the interesting things that uh, you mentioned, this was kind of earlier on was uh, when you were looking at kind of group responses versus individual responses, when you're coaching teams versus coaching an individual and, and how things are going to change. And so one of the things that I found that was pretty interesting is like, if you look at all of the different, I guess, paradigms of, of like periodization, right? Whether it's like, conjugate or I don't know, linear block, whatever, like regardless of which one you choose, you're always going to find like a, a plethora of just really high level athletes, which to me anyways, like over, over the last couple of years, my sense of things has kind of shifted from there is kind of an optimal approach and, and kind of shifted a little bit more towards just effort. Like for me anyways, I, th I think that the big defining factor is, is effort and staying free from injury. If we're just talking purely like mechanical stuff, right? If you can put in high effort sessions as frequently as possible and recover well enough so you can stay injury free, 
I, I don't know that it matters a whole lot what you're doing. Obviously, outside of just doing ridiculous stuff, like we're not talking about doing like a single arm kettlebell pistol squat on a BOSU ball, right? Assuming you're doing like reasonable stuff. Um, and, and it's funny because when you look at the research as well, like when you look at inter-individual differences within a study, you'll see a whole host of different training responses. You'll see non-responders, you'll see individuals who have an incredibly robust response to training and, and everything in between. But then when you compare groups, you know, from different training methodologies, a lot of the times they're fairly equivocal. Um, you know, when you compare like low volume, high volume, things like that. And so you're kind of like, oh, they're the same. Right. And a lot of the times people will say that they're like, oh, well, there's no difference, you know, from a hypertrophic standpoint between training with really high volume, close proximity to failure or training with higher loads, lower, lower repetitions per set. It's like, well, there's a pretty massive difference if you look at the differences within groups, you know, and you look at subject, individual subject response. And so I think that kind of lends a little bit more towards what you're saying of like, hey, we need to pay attention to this because, I mean, group averages are great at delineating like, hey, what are some reasonable starting points? But then beyond that, how do we really refine the process for the individual athlete that we're working with? You know, what kind of, what kind of guidelines can we give even collectively as a group? to maybe help them refine the process and, and give them key indicators of like, Hey, you know, these are the things you need to look out for. And then this is the kind of changes you need to make. If, if a, then do B, if B, then do C and things like that. And so, um, yeah, that, I, I don't know that I have a question over that. It was just kind of like oh, a little tangent that I went off on. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me jump in there then take the pressure off. Uh, you, you said a couple of really interesting things are, one thing you said was, and I, I don't know if you said, uh, yeah, cause people to think or cause people to think deeply. And in a sense, that's the core of my message. Let's not take these historical assumptions as fact. They're just these historical assumptions that clearly don't hold they don't hold so what we should do is think and if we want to use periodization use periodization but let's do it you know mindfully let, let, let's do it with awareness and let's do it with a knowledge that okay you know if you like these are the rules but they're not rules so i need to be aware i need to watch what's happening i need to monitor what's happening i need to be prepared to change i need to be prepared to shorten a phase, lengthen a phase, adapt a phase. Um, because training errors mount up. Training errors cost time, cost progress, cost energy, cause injuries. And training errors come, I think, when we make these really blunt, kind of generalized decisions and then push them out for too long. We try and stick to the plan. There's a difference. Me and you could have the exact same plan. But I think that sticking to a plan is a good thing. I think that that's um, a virtue. Whereas you think, yeah, well, I made a plan because you have to have a plan. But I'm going to change. As information arises, I will change my plan. And you would be surprised how many of us as coaches have this mindset that, well, once you plan, you're supposed to stick to the plan, and that's a good thing. It's like, you know, you have this, oh, yeah, well, I'll stick to the plan. Sticking to a plan that is really just a random guess, a random projection into the future, sticking to that is not a virtue. It's foolish in, in my book, and it causes injuries, it, uh, and it prolongs, it escalates training errors. So I think we need to plan, but we also need to plan to change. I am going to be sensitive to emerging information, and I'm going to change depending on what that information is, is, is telling me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's a, that's also another issue too, right. Is, is when people take a really great concept, but apply it to the wrong context, you know, so like mental toughness, right. And, and just like grinding through and putting in the work. It's mm -hmm. like, there's some in instances where that's absolutely necessary. And yeah, you just have to shut the fuck up and stick to the plan and then there's other instances where it's like, hey, we've got, we've got enough indicators to, to suggest this is probably not a good idea to push forward. We should probably back it off a little bit, maybe even just like take the rest of the session off. It seems like you just need to recover, right? Um, 
And again, that's just something that kind of comes with experience, right? It's like all of these are good ideas. Pushing through discomfort is a good idea. Uh, listening to your body and maybe taking time away is, is a good idea and everything in between, right? But then it's like, sometimes I think people use those as kind of like a crutch or an excuse to get out of doing what they have to do. Like I had an athlete the other day who was like, man, I'm really exhausted. So I'm just going to kind of call it here. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're going to finish the last three sets and you're going to stop being a little bitch. You know what I mean? Like, and so this is, this is someone I have a very good relationship with. I've coached them for a very long time. So I can just kind of be stern like that with them. Um, and, but, it, but it's like, it, it's like in this instance, you have to push it, Your performance is great. There's no indication that you need to slow down. You need to push hard. And then in another instance, they might be like, Oh, I'm feeling really down because we've got to do more sets. And I might be like, Hey, you know what? You just need to back it off, drop the weight a little bit and, and things like that. And that just kind of knows, comes with like knowing your athlete, I guess. Well, yeah, but I, I guess what that is a, a really good example of is you as a coach are observing, taking in information and deciding, making a judgment call. Do I change? Do I push on? Yeah. And there isn't a right or wrong. It's context specific. And you have to weigh off a load of factors. And some of those factors are, okay, is this going to be good for the athlete if I back up? Or am I nurturing an athlete who always backs up? Or if I push them, are they going to break? And there isn't a right or wrong decision. That's a judgment call that has to be made. And it's a great example because, again, I know this might be outside of you know your listenership's uh, kind of interest, but if you're a professional team sport in a lot of cultures, you know, if this indicator, if this measure goes off, there's like <laughs> little kind of micro panic. Um, and it kind of sets up a culture sometimes of athletes who are overly sensitive, athletes who are physically robust but psychologically fragile because the coaches are leaving measurements to the thinking rather than using measurements to inform decisions, but doing the thinking based on your experience and in collaboration, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, dialogue with the athlete where appropriate. But you're right. And that's the problem, right? This is a complex, coaching is a complex mindfuck. And you have got to rock up ready and prepared to think hard, sometimes think quick, sometimes pause decisions so you can think about them in slower time. But you have to be on. Coaching to me is a performance. Um, uh, yeah, and I kind of, this is probably revealing too much now, but if I'm coaching a session, I, I prepare for it the same as the athlete would prepare, not obviously by physically warming up, but by trying to get my head in the game and trying to get my coaching face on and trying to park all the daily bullshit that accumulates and all the daily stress and the traffic and the kid was up all night. And the exact same as with an athlete. You'd say, well, you need to be clear-headed and make decisions. We need to do that as coaches. We also need to be aware, as, that, you know, as I said earlier, from my perspective, a coach is an agent of placebo or nocebo, you know, nocebo being, you know, the evil twin of placebo. But the one thing about nocebo is, and again, the science suggests it is, I don't know how they estimated this, but the, the estimate is six times greater than placebo effect. Now, let's just take that as vaguely correct. You're still saying that you give some positive information to the athlete or the athlete looks at you and in the heat of the moment when the athlete is starting to panic, they look to their coach and the coach is calm and gives them, you know, a, a good keyword, a good cue. That is not as powerful as the athlete looks to you with a key moment and you're there biting your fingernails or panicking or with a you know big open mouth and just look like you were stressed. That's bad coaching. We need to kind of control and manage our presentation to the athletes 
because it does have an effect on how they respond to that set of squats they did on Monday. Yeah, absolutely. So we're uh, we're coming up on about an hour and a half, and again, I want to be respectful of your time. So, um, just to end off here, where where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, about some of the writings that you put out, some of the work that you're doing? Uh, well, um, kind of the social media presence. I am uh, pretty lightweight. I'm, I'm on Twitter um, at simply sports I. So simply sports sci. SCI, yeah, that would get me. Uh, I'm on Instagram periodically, uh, not uh, too dramatic at the same name, at, at the same handle. Uh, if, if you'll allow me, there was one other thing that might, that, that might be worth saying, uh, and it, it was something you said a few minutes ago about, you know, you can take all these periodization models and it doesn't really matter which one you jump in at. And I totally agree with that. And again, in kind of, I, I do a lot of kind of contract works where you might be parachuted into a, a not parachuted in. It's not like special forces, <laughs> you know. Um, but you might arrive into a squad that you don't know, and you're there with them for six weeks or something like that. And you know, the head coach will always have some different planning mentality. But I kind of don't think it's not, you know, for, for me. It's not really a problem. It's not relevant. They're all sensible. All the coaches are experienced and working at a decent level for a decent number of years. So they're always sensible. The kind of shape, the framework doesn't matter. I guess what what does matter for me is that um, changes are always subtle. The biggest driver of injury, the biggest driver of last training, compromised training, is sudden change. You know, if you could boil it down to, if there was a law, that would be my law. You know, how you modulate training, take your pick. So many ways to do it. Whatever way works for you or that you believe in, do it. But if there's sudden change, there will be an escalation of problems. Biology only adapts at a certain rate. It doesn't, you know, it can't adapt rapidly, progressively all the time. Um, so it's around those times of change that we need to be especially, uh, I would say, um, paranoid, maybe is the right word. We need to be really careful. And I guess the thing with making those mistakes is you don't often get indications that they're happening. It's like, they just happen. If an injury happens, you can't take it back. You can't rub it out. It's happened. And it's like an asymmetric risk profile. It's not like if I push up training, it'll go well, it'll go well, it'll go well, and then it'll gradually start to get worse. No, it'll go up like this and it'll fall off a cliff. And then you're screwed because then you're out for six weeks or you're missing four weeks or whatever it is. Or worse, there's a legacy left there after two years, which often happens. Well, with injury, so I'm going the long way around saying a sudden change for me is the enemy. I think sometimes in some contexts it's justified, but if we're making that choice, we just need to do it with open eyes, knowing that, okay, risk is going to be elevated here for a couple of weeks. How can I best manage that? Yeah. Yeah, I know that makes sense, especially, I mean, when, when you look at like injuries and acute loading and, and acute spikes in volume, that, that tends to be fairly predictive of, uh, of injury as well, or injury risk anyways. Um, yeah, so John, that, this is a super, super interesting conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to jump on here and uh, have this chat with me. Uh, I know all the listeners have, have taken a lot from it. I've definitely taken a lot from it. And it's kind of given me a couple different avenues to to go and pursue myself. So thanks so much for jumping on, man. I appreciate it. No, listen, it was, it was a real pleasure. I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, one of the features have been, it's, it's obviously your morning, my evening. So I've had a string of coffees, so I apologize if I rattled on too much. But uh, no, it's such a good no. topic. There's so much to say in it that uh, it, it's hard to, uh, to shut up sometimes on it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. All right, man, you take care. You too, thank you.